Thank you for the kind introduction and really thanks to the organizers to bringing me here uh, in this rainy Boston. Uh, hopefully the weather indeed uh, will improve, but at least I made it. I thought actually I will be stuck yesterday in Atlanta airport. So today I really would like to talk a bit uh, about opportunities that flexible electronics can offer. And clearly I don't have possibly to convince this audience about it. I really will uh, highlight this from a material scientist view. As uh, Tina mentioned, I'm a material scientist. I'm now the chair of the School of Material Science at Georgia Tech. So I will not really that much go into the device functions. Though clearly the potential is great. So from the building blocks like diodes, light emitting diodes, uh, transistors and solar cells, we really started to open up. I'm not sure if the, the laser pointer works. It doesn't, does it? Yeah, well, uh, most of the time I possibly don't need it anyway. So uh, you see from this slide that we really can open applications in sensors, medical diagnostics, large area electronics. Ah, that's actually great. Uh, and other parts from communications. It's not the best either. I just go without, it's fine. Uh, anyway, what flexible electronics also really can build on is the materials diversity. The chemists over the last possibly 30 years really have been very innovative, both uh, on small molecule side, as you see on the top of the slides, to the polymers that have become more and more sophisticating leading to high mobility structures like the PD, PB, TTT polymer. We definitely have though to work about the abbreviations. I will start though to show also how beside chemistry, we can introduce multiple functionalities simply by blending what is done in the commodity polymer world. So here I use as an example, one of the first generation uh, polymer semiconductor that is solution processable, P3HD. And uh, just show when we can actually blend it, so mix it with a commodity polymer like polyethylene, we can combine the properties of both materials. So we can make semiconducting species that are also mechanically tough. So from this picture, you see actually that you combine the color, it comes from the conjugation in the, uh, in the chemical structure of the P3HD with mechanical toughness. So this was a tape that you made a knot in. This is actually quite often used in textile industry simply to check is something really tough because in many cases actually, as soon as you try to make a knot, it will actually break. Clearly we can quantify that with simple tensile tests. So you take the tape and stretch it and you see or you measure when it breaks. And you clearly see that for P3HD, and maybe I can actually use the pointer that will help actually, voila. So if you take normal semiconductor like P3HD, it's actually pretty brittle, as brittle as PMMA, plexiglass, or polystyrene, where um, you often use in polystyrene cups. However, as soon as we make blends of the P3HD with polyethylene, you see you can actually nicely draw the material and you get actually uh, a bit of a strain hardening, meaning you orient your chains, the molecular chains in the material and therefore you increase a bit the strength. Clearly in case we add an insulator, polyeth polyethylene is an insulator into a semiconductor, we have to check what happens to the electronic properties. So here we did simple transistor measurements. So a three terminal device with two, so two electrodes, the source and the drain in red, the gate in gray. And if you apply a gate bias, we polarize the insulator next to a semiconductor creating charges that we can afterwards manipulate with the source drain bias. One key a uh, property of such a transistor is the mobility. So how easy can the charges move from one side to the other? And here you see if we plot P3HD, the semiconductor by itself, and we add more and more uh, polyethylene in the transistor, uh, if you use a linear polyethylene, 
So this one is pretty crystalline. We can get to 99% of insulator added to our semiconductor, and we still have essentially the same device function. This changes a bit when we use more branched polyethylenes, linear low density polyethylene or ultra low density polyethylene, because you reduce uh, the degree of crystallinity in the insulator. But even here, you can add up to 90 weight percent of insulator and still have working devices. Why is that important? Clearly, you massively increase the robustness of the, the active layer and therefore actually of the whole device. Clearly, if we start to blend to semi-crystalline materials, we have to be careful with processing. It's not that you just mix and match. You have to control a bit how the materials solidify. And what we do here is we measure uh, solutions of the P3HD in the solvent here, xylene, and the polyethylene xylene. And we recorded at what temperature those materials will crystallize. So here you see P3HD. When you add the solvent, you can massively decrease the dissolution temperature to room temperature. Polyethylene, because it's very... Uh, it has only carbon and hydrogen, doesn't interact much with the solvent. You have much less of a depression of the crystallization temperature. But why is that important? If you now would process, as we often do, simply take the hot solution and apply it at room temperature, polyethylene will crystallize first, then the P3HD. So that really hinders the ordering, the molecular ordering of the semiconductor, and you do not get uh, functioning devices. However, if you do what actually it's pretty common in commodity polymer world, you cast your films at higher temperatures, you see above a certain temperatures, the P3HD will always first crystallize and only afterwards the polyethylene. And that helps. So you, you create crystals of the P3HD and then the polyethylene, while it crystallizes, pushes things together. So you get a double percolation network. And ideally, you would actually cast it at the temperature where both crystallize together. So you really have a very fine phase separation. So now just to check, uh, to show adding the insulator not only actually helps with mechanical properties. So here now we went to a bit of a newer generation of semiconductors from the E. McCulloch group uh, with DPP. So this is this unit, TT, the diethiophene here and here the thiophene, therefore T, so DPP, TTT uh, polymer, which is pretty known to be a good uh, transistor material. The problem though of this material is if you expose it to air after eight hours, if you plot again the source current versus the gate bias, remember if you apply gate bias, we create charges, therefore current goes up, you start to have uh, the appearance of this bump in your uh, transistor characteristic that indicates that you have some sort of doping. Also, the threshold slope is not really nice, meaning you really uh, need to apply a lot of voltage to get actually to a relatively good off to on ratio. If you use the blend though and expose it also to air, you see we actually keep the good transistor characteristics of TPP, TTT, T. So the question is why? Uh, we simply ruled out chemical degradation because we only uh, exposed it to air. So we assumed by the exposure, usually we create traps and adding the polyethylene, we reduce the amount of traps in our device. So we made uh, quite a few blends. So just in black, the neat TPP, TTTT. Then you add more and more of the polyethylene up to 95, 8% here in yellow. And uh, we used again a bottom gate um, transistor device. And what you see is the threshold uh, voltage, the more polyethylene we add, it gets more and more to zero uh, volts which is good, of course, if you want to do device integration. As importantly, it's the subthreshold slope. So how fast does the device switch on? And you see the subthreshold slope, slope gets smaller and smaller, means it gets steeper and steeper. So the more polyethylene we add, the easier does the device switch on. 
And there seems to be a sweet spot around 58% actually. And we can now directly relate the number of traps in our device based on the subthreshold slope, because all the other parameters are given either by the device or are known uh, constants. And what you see here now, if you list the number of traps with more and more polyethylene, you see we reduce nearly by seven times the number of traps in our device when adding the polyethylene. And I have to say, it, this is not because uh, polyethylene is a good oxygen barrier. Uh, polyethylene is actually known to not have really barrier functions with respect to uh, oxygen, but we believe it is. It keeps the moisture out. It's very apolar. And therefore, um, you don't introduce so many traps because less moisture gets in. But why is this important to, to have this trap reduction? The reason is, for instance, bias stress, also pretty common in like silicon devices. So if you apply a constant voltage bias stress of 20 volts over time, you see the device really starts to degrade over time. So you lose actually the on-off ratio and you shift the threshold slope. Once we did uh, the one-to-one -one blend where we know we reduced the amount of traps, this effect is massively reduced. So you not only make a mechanically tough uh, device, but you also make it much, much more robust electronically. And that's also shown here, the threshold uh, shift over time if you have the neat material, uh, neat material, you see it degrades over uh, a few ten thousands of seconds versus actually once we do the blend, this is massively reduced. And clearly you can play other tricks. So one at Jujescu, for instance, in top gate devices, applied another polymer layer coating on top of the functioning device. And I think the combination should help to keep the device pretty stable for a long time. The same is actually true for N-type uh, devices. So using uh, Antonio Facchetti's N2200, a known um, material for N-type devices, you see if you expose a device in air over eight hours, the, the device really drastically uh, reduces its uh, its performance, you lower the on-off ratio and you have a drastic shift of more than 20 volts in the uh, threshold voltage. Though once you make the blend, you see there's actually not really such a drastic effect. Again, highlighting why blending actually can be very fruitful. And also I have to say here, we had actually a um, top gate device, which indicates the good performance doesn't come because, for instance, the P3HD goes to one end of your film and you have it covered by polyethylene. Clearly, we have a very, very good intermixing. And we can measure that, actually. So that was still uh, a while back. We made five micron thick films of P3HD and its blend. So 80-20 means here 80% of P3HD, 20% of polyethylene and we measured time of flight measurements. What does it mean? So we made thick films, we shine light on top, create charges. And what is done is really you measure essentially the time till the charges you created get to the bottom of the film. And that's indicated here where you get an inflection point of the current. So we put here the arrows and you see in the bulk. So this, this is really bulk transport. If you had polyethylene, the arrival time is massively shortened, showing that actually reducing the number of traps helps charge transport through the bulk. And that's also true for electrons. Electrons obviously are much easier trapped. So actually in the neat P3HD, we can't measure anything. But once we actually add the blend, you see we can get, we can measure the charge transport relatively easily. And we still maintain for the electrons bulk transport till about 65-8% uh, of polyethylene. For the holes, once you get above 20, 35-60% um, uh, of polyethylene, you lose the charge transport. But still, it's pretty good. So you can add something that costs one cent uh, per kilogram to something 
that costs possibly $500 per gram and you make your uh, electronic properties better. Where this can be used is solar cells and photo detectors. So where you actually need the bulk transport. So just here, we went first just with the fruit file, uh, bulk heterojunction, P3HD, the donor and PCBM, a fullerene solution processable fullerene, the acceptor, added polyethylene. And here you see typical uh, JV curves. What you see is if you add polyethylene, the short circuit current, of course, gets down Why you add an insulator to your material. So you absorb less light and therefore actually your performance goes down. And you can plot that here. So here you have just the binary, so the blend of P3HD and the fullerene versus here we have the ternary where we added polyethylene because you have lesser light absorption um, performance as measured by the short circuit current goes down. However, when we made actually thicker films, which is very easy, and I come to that uh, at the very end, when you add an uh, insulator, you can put like molecular weight in, which controls the viscosity into the insulator. So that means you can very easily get thicker films. So you get, can make films that are thicker and absorb essentially the same amount as the, the, the blend without the insulator. And once you do that, you see that the performance is essentially identical. And if you made that for all of the compositions, you see similar like with time of flight, we observe that we can add up to uh, 48 percent of polyethylene, maybe even 50. So it, it really directly correlates with the bulk charge transport. So for solar cells, obviously the mechanical toughness is really important because there you really need the large area uh, uh, fabrication and as mentioned actually for the photo detectors that will be really important because now we can get with relatively ease thick films uh, that are a robuster but have still also very good uh, absorption properties so we, we can actually get now tapes this was actually melt processed similar like a uh, uh, pet bottle would be done and still get both type both benefits of the world, toughness as well as bulk charge transport. So we can get thicker and mechanically robust films and keep the efficiencies. Clearly, uh, control of film thickness is very important for other devices, such as organic electrochemical transistors, where you have an electrolyte essentially that act as a gate. And what people do more and more is use similar semiconductors as we had in the transistor world. So this is essentially our P3HD unit over here. But we have in many cases, especially in case you want to run them in um, aqueous electrolytes, you have to make them a bit more polar so the electrolytes really can move into your system. So here we use the random copolymer. So we just randomly uh, combined those two monomer units. The problem is though, in many cases, it's still slow. So while we have some polarity up here, it's not sufficient really to get the ions to the backbone. The ions will then electrochemically dope the backbone and that leads then to the charge transport. So what we did is uh, blend with a block polymer. So we use the block polymer, which has additional hydrophilic groups that should help the aqueous electrolyte to move into our film. But we still kept actually the our P3HD block here to compatibilize, so help the mixing between the two. Because if you mix something relatively apolar with something polar, we know from oil and water, uh, it would have been difficult. Clearly also our hope was that having an uh, active component on our additive will help uh, with charge transport. And here you see the device characteristics are pretty similar like in a usual transistor. So you have the gate bias versus the source strain bias over here. Uh, you see if you measure slowly, so it's 0 0.01 volts per second, you get relatively decent uh, OECT performances. 
but you immediately see if you just have the material by itself, the faster you go, you the charges that you create can't keep up. So this really tells us immediately you have trouble with actually ion uptake is fine, but then also getting the ions out really is problematic. And that's why you start to have these massive hysteresis and you reduce you you have trouble to reach the same uh, current. So now when we went with the blend, so here we added 25-8% of the block copolymer. You see independent of speed, even when we go to relatively fast uh, measuring rates, we actually do not keep, we do not get uh, hysteresis. So we can now really manipulate our system to what we like. So for some applications, actually you want to have the hysteresis, for some actually not. So by uh, controlling the amount of the block copolymer we add in, we can now pretty well controlled, uh, control the hysteresis. And that's also shown here. So here, the hysteresis is giving with the threshold shift between forward and backward scan. So if you have the neat material, you see the faster you go, so this is the sweep rate, the faster you go, your hysteresis gets more and more pronounced. Once you add the block copolymer, you can actually keep the device performance essentially the same without uh, hysteresis to very high speeds. And even if you go super fast, uh, you still are much better than the neat material. The other characteristic, the transconductance, uh, which is an important device characteristic, uh, is analogous to this. So if you have the neat material, the transconductance really drops by nearly two orders of magnitude. However, once you add the blend, even at fast uh, scanning rates, you can keep the performance. And even if you go ultra fast, it's actually a drop by about five, not orders of magnitude. And this can be actually summarized here where we plot the transconductance of the neat material and the blend um, as factor of the device geometry. So if you have larger devices, similar like in normal transistors, thin film transistors, it's not really that sensitive to the device geometry. So the transconductance is sort of the same, but you see at faster speeds and smaller device geometries, you see here massive divergence uh, in the device parameters versus here in the blend. We really independent of geometry, size of the device and rate, we get the same transconductance, which obviously helps in case we want to integrate uh, such uh, uh, OECTs in let's say neuromorphic uh, systems, et cetera. And because the speed is faster, it, it really nicely, if you, we, we manipulate the gate bias, you see if you only have the neat material, the material is too slow actually to really follow the gate bias versus once we add the blend, you see you have actually really nice response, nice and fast response to the uh, applied bias. Clearly, as in, as always, when you blend, uh, you have a sweet spot. So if you plot the mobility versus capacitance, it's one of the key parameters of organic electrochemical transistors for different, uh, again, scan rates and different block copolymer contents. You see, uh, as shown, the neat material has massive different uh, response also for the mu C star. But once we blend, we get actually systems where mu C star is nearly independent of the, the scan rate. And if you then also look at the threshold voltage change, so that's really, again, the hysteresis, you get two systems where you can reduce hysteresis over here while still keep a relatively high mu C star. So these blends, between 25 and 35.8% of the block copolymer really lead to the best compromise of speed and um, minimized hysteresis. So why is this approach so important? 
it now with blending we can really open up the material space those who work on organic uh, electrochemical transistors or even eco fats which are often used for sensors in many cases chemists really do a beautiful job in um, getting the polymers uh, functionalized so that they can uptake electrolytes so often they introduce glycolated side chains or alcohols but that often leads also to stability issues because if you take in or the device actually takes in too much ions it swells you have a volume change and with time that leads to the failure mechanical failure of the device so now if you just look at the material so p3hht now not the blend over time so you see it's slow in ion uptake uh, in case we apply a voltage, so the voltage is the square function here in the dashed line. And you can though really measure over a long, long time and you see the response stays exactly the same. If you take another very commonly used uh, semiconductor for OECTs, P.PSS, often used also as electrode material, you see while it has a fast response to the applied bias, it really very rapidly degrades over time. And most of the time, this is really mechanical failure. So here now we can actually, similar like with the organic thin film transistors, we can introduce uh, with new chemistry and in particular then also with blending uh, mechanical robustness. And that's also shown here, as mentioned, this is really for because of the swelling. Here we can compare the P3HHT so that's the one where you just have one alcohol group at the end of the side chains with a glycolated polymer that the chemist called PG2TTT, which simply means uh, you have uh, essentially a, a thiophene backbone. You have actually have two fused thiophene rings in there. Other side chains, you have ethylene oxide side chains. So this is very polar. And uh, how you measure now the volume change is via quartz crystal microbalance. And here you see if you apply voltages, we get a change in the frequency response and the dissipation. So the two of them give you uh, information on mass uptake as well as actually the stiffness of the material. And you see once we apply a voltage, we have a reduction in the frequency. It means we take, we take mass up. So we have a volume change. But for the P3HHT, it's much, much smaller than where you see here for the glycolated material, where you have a massive uh, change in mass and therefore volume, which similar like with PSS, leads eventually not to electronic failure, but because of the constant uh, volume change, it will fail mechanically. So therefore, now we can really start to play, and that's really the chemist. So we looked at, at the moment at P3HHT and its copolymers. Clearly, we can start to introduce more and more uh, fused rings. Why is that? That should help the electronic charge transport. So meaning once we get the ions in and can electrochemically dope the, the, the backbone, this should definitely help to increase the transistor performance because we will have faster electronic charge transport. What I also like to say is though, and I have to say, we can stick to just having these alcohol groups, maybe an ether linkage here, because we can introduce then some um, hydrophilic properties by blending with the block polymer as shown with the P3HHT. So we do not need to put all functions on the polymer itself. So here we really design for electronic charge transport, some hydrophilicity, but then the most of the hydrophilicity, which helps ion uptake, we can introduce into the second component. And how powerful this is, I can show with a classical polymer semiconductor. I go back to P3HD. In case you make a organic electrochemical transistor with P3HD, even when you use a organic electrolytes, so this is not aqueous. You see independent uh, of what gate bias you apply, zero to 0 .9, um, 0 0.9 volt, you do not have amplification of your signal. So this means ions likely do not get into your material, 
cannot uh, electrochemically dope the material and therefore you do not get electronic charge transport as measured with the source strain current. However, once we add the block copolymer, it's obviously not the most beautiful transistor ever, and I'm sure we, but you can get the P3HD working. So why is that important? So especially on the chemistry side, it means we can now start looking into all the materials like the DPP TTTs I showed before that have been optimized for thin film transistors. And we do not have to necessarily go to glycolated side chains because in case there are chemists in the room, glycolated side chains are a nightmare. They are so hydrophilic that they will just absorb anything and it's very difficult to purify. So this really will open up the material space for organic electrochemical transistors, uh, ecofets, and other devices used in neuromorphic uh, systems, sensors, etc. And now I see I have time just to finalize why blending also helps. So far, I tried to convince you, hopefully, that with blending, we can enrich the systems we have. We already have a super nice uh, material space because the chemists have synthesized so many uh, polymers, small molecules, etc. And by blending, we can help with mechanical robustness. We can help with device stability if it's electronically, uh, like with bias stress, or again, mechanically. We can help with electrolyte uptake in organic electrochemical transistors. But one key part that I alluded to with the polyethylene uh, blends with making thick films, uh, blending really helps also with processing because you can put the viscosity control on the uh, additive. Because those who know conjugated polymers, especially the, the last generation, they're very difficult to synthesize. So usually you have relatively small molecular weights. What does that mean? You're very limited in viscosity. They're nearly too short. So for the Italians in the room, it's really like having spaghetti versus macaroni. So clearly you have to eat them differently. So, and it, it's nearly impossible to get there from the macaronis to the spaghettis. But here now we can actually play, and as mentioned, put the molecular weight, so the length of the molecules into the additive, and that will help us with controlling the processing and the viscosity so it's adapted to the manufacturing you would like to do. And this is really actually summarized here. If you measure the specific viscosity in solution with molecular weight, so the chain length, so here macaroni versus here spaghettis, very typical behavior of a polymer is that you have a linear increase of the viscosity with the length of your material, of the molecules. And then suddenly at a certain moment in time, which we call the critical molecular weight, you have a drastic increase of the viscosity. Why is that? Here in this regime, you have the macaronis. So they're too short. They do not entangle. They don't form knots. Once you hit this critical molecular weight, you start really to have uh, knots, entanglements, and that drives the viscosity up. And in most cases, if you do processing, you really want to be in this regime. Down here, every little thing you change, even in a minute manner, will change in a different polymorph, different molecular arrangement, versus here, actually, it's much, much more reproducible. So I would call that usually these are high molecular weight materials. Below the molecular critical molecular weight, these are low molecular weight materials. And why does it matter? It matters once you do indeed the blends. So here are blends of a short molecular weight P3HT, so 60 kilograms per mole, and also a short molecular weight of PVDF. And you see when you blend them, nearly whatever you do, you cannot trick the system and they really face separate. So you see the dark areas are the PVDF rich areas, the light areas here are the P3HD. The reason is, uh, yeah, you have really unhindered molecular transport. So if you deposit the film, the molecules just can essentially move away from each other. 
Once though you start to have higher molecular weights of both, so they can actually make knots between themselves and actually so with between the two different polymers. And therefore, once you make films, you get very homogeneous films. For those who have polymer science, this is actually counterintuitive because they will always tell you the higher the molecular weight, the more the polymers will like to phase separate. So they do not like to mix because you do not gain really an entropy. But this is only true for melt processing. Um, and just again, the reason in solution processing why it happens is in solution, you can actually compatibilize the two species. If you have a solvent that likes both of the materials, uh, you have a homogeneous solution, but in case the molecular molecules are too small, they're not entangled, they just can diffuse away from each other, and therefore you have the phase separation, as we've seen before. However, in the high molecular weights, you can get knots, as shown here, between the two different species. And then during film drying, uh, mass transport is really hindered, and you freeze it actually in a thermodynamic uh, metastable state. And therefore, you get these really nice homogeneous intermixed films. And as mentioned, this is very different than your melt process, because in melt processing, you will never get a homogeneous liquid already. And therefore, the scenario is very different. And you can easily track that with simple thermal analysis. So DSC, differential scanning calorimetry, just measures essentially melting temperatures. So here you have the melting temperature of the semiconductor. Here you have the melting temperature of PVDF, which is actually a ferroelectric polymer. And you see when you process from solution, you have an exotherm. This means here the film crystallizes. So at the beginning, you have actually an amorphous intermixed film. And only when you heat will you get enough thermal energy for this metastable state to phase separate. And therefore, then you see the melting of the PVDF-rich and the P3HD-rich phases. So vitrification leads to intermixing. And I show how that actually can be used. In, in the melt, however, because already you, it's very difficult to get actually a homogeneous liquid, you do not have this crystallization. And you see here you have on the bottom the PVDF, on the top the P3HD, and they melt essentially at the, their temperature. The fact that we don't see any cold crystallization means they're already phase separated from the beginning. So melt processing leads to phase separation. Why in our world is intermixing important? Well, now you can actually use the ferroelectric properties of the insulator to affect the electronic properties of your semiconductor. So because you will affect the local environment. So you have something polar very close to your chains of the semiconductor. And just to indicate that, so PVDF can be apolar. It's called the alpha phase. So if you have fluorines, they should be green, but they're in red. Fluorines are alternating on a top and bottom position. In white, you have the hydrogens. So hydro the hydrogen atoms are slightly positive. The fluorines are slightly negative. So you do not have uh, overall polarity. But the ferroelectric phase of this polymer, you have all the fluorines on one side. So you create a dipole uh, from the hydrogen to the fluorines, so positive to the negative. And you can imagine if you now have a very fine intermixing. So this will influence actually the electronics of your semiconductor. And uh, we can indicate that just with very simple uh, absorption measurement. So here you see the dashed line is just, again, once more, the P3HD, the absorption. And here, this one is the photoluminescence. Now, when you add the PVDF, you already see changes. They're subtle, but they are there in the absorption of the P3HD. The 001 transition goes slightly up. So that usually means you slightly uh, get uh, uh, electronic uh, 
alignment more along the backbone. So it means you go from what the physicists will call H-like to a more J-like aggregation. And therefore, then you get a much, much stronger emission. So you add an insulator and what you do, you actually amend the emission properties of your semiconductor. And that's pretty universal. So here on this side, we use PC11. So this is actually a transistor material. Uh, it's sometimes also used in organic solar cells. And you see exactly the same. If you have here the dashed line absorption of the PC11, if you add the ferrolactic polymer, you see that the zero zero goes up. It's not as pronounced as in the P3HD, but as importantly, you see the PL really, really goes up. So you clearly change the exciton uh, dynamics, and that is really relevant once you would go actually to organic solar cells, for instance. And we can also follow this change with the temperature dependence of the photoluminescence. And we plot this 0, 0 versus 0, 1, so the ratio between 0, 0 and 0, 1, just in actually the, actually it's over here for the P3HDs, 0, 0, 0, 1, this ratio. So this gives you a bit of an information on H versus J-like character, meaning do you have more coherence perpendicular to the polymer chains or along the chains? And again, so here you see P3HD with temperature, the ratio goes up, but it's always H-like, so a coherence uh, perpendicular to the chain. Now you go to the blends and you see you influence the H, uh, the aggregate formation, so really the, the exciton delocalization first perpendicular, then actually uh, more along the chain. And it's intriguing where these transitions happen. So you can actually manipulate the transitions with the amount of the PVDF. So you definitely change the electronics. And we now assume it has to do actually with the polarity of the PVDF, which is affected, which affects the dielectric constant. So these are literature values that we took. So the, these, these circles reflect the dielectric constant of the PVDF with temperature. And here you have the photoluminescence that we measure. And you see, we, we see changes exactly when the dielectric constant of the insulator actually changes. And in case we plot now here the derivative of the dielectric constants, you see the photoluminescence really follows that. So this tells us that really adding the insulator, we change the electronics. And if the insulator changes its dielectric properties. So we will change the environment and we will affect the optoelectronics of the semiconductor. And this is only possible because we know how to make finely intermixed uh, films. So I hope I could show you that uh, we not only can use a lot of very different semiconductors, but by putting insulators in there from polyethylene that helps with mechanical robustness and really gives sort of a bit of a water barrier that hinders then also oxygen to get in or a ferroelectric polymers, we can really help and introduce functions that otherwise are not possible in the single semiconductor. So we can introduce mechanical robustness. We can introduce electronic robustness in the devices. We can make uh, or, or render materials that are otherwise not possible to be used in organic or electrochemical transistors, meaning we have a much, much broader pot to look into for device making. And we can start to use also some functional insulator like PVDF, ferroelectric, to actually manipulate the optoelectronics of the semiconductor. So clearly the question is where else should we go? Uh, as mentioned, I think the biggest, uh, one of the biggest options is in the organic electrochemical transistor area, because once we do not need the glycolated side chains, we have much, much more freedom in selecting materials. Clearly with the ferroelectric materials, uh, we are wondering, can we introduce on purpose materials that are ferroelectric as well as semiconducting, which sounds a bit counterintuitive, 
and really open up entirely new device functions so that we can go way beyond the uh, applications that uh, already currently are fully exploited. And I'm sure this week we hear a lot about sensors, smart textiles, et cetera. And with that, I like to thank to many of the collaborators I have worked with, as you saw from the beginning of the slide, we started a lot of the blending when I was still at Imperial College. I moved to Georgia Tech seven years ago. I have strong collaborations with NIST, Gitti Frey in Israel and Carla Silva, where we look at the exiton dynamics of such blends and many, many students, uh, both still at Imperial College and now at Georgia Tech. And finally, I have to make a bit of advertisement. I'm editor of chief in the, of the Journal of Materials Chemistry C. You're possibly much more applied, but please uh, look into us in case you have uh, work on sensors, transistors, we are very happy. And in case it's more on the material side, uh, there's also materials advances. And I think with that, we should have now still plenty of time uh, for questions. And otherwise, we have a break. I guess many of you had flight troubles yesterday. So I think it's good to have a bit of uh, some rest.